dir schaffen wir die Klimawende. Jetzt bewerben. Wiener Stadtwerke Gruppe. Is there a truly sustainable building or what is a truly sustainable building or if you want it a little bit religiously is there a one true sustainable building? Uh, it indeed sounds like a faith-based question but I argue that's a very essential one. Uh, we all live in buildings. We spend most of our lives in buildings. If you think about the span of your life as one week, too short, but just for the sake of argument, from Monday to Saturday, you spend it inside buildings. If all goes well, equivalent of the time of Sunday, you're outside. That's why one of the most terrible things we can imagine is not having a roof over our head to be as it were homeless, right? So we expect from our buildings to offer conditions that are conducive to human health, comfort, satisfaction, productivity. And hence, this is one of our most, so to speak, important assets. But buildings are important also because of a second reason. They represent major interventions in the environment. You can see that intervention from the outer space. To construct buildings, to operate them, you need huge, massive amounts of materials, energy, resources. And in that sense, any discussion of sustainability in the context of buildings is a valid, important discussion. But my point is that there are certain issues about discourse that may be, and I would like to propose that to you that may be somewhat misguided and even misleading. I attend a lot of conferences and meetings and uh, symposia about this subject. We talk about green architecture and sustainable buildings and so on and so forth. And sometimes I have a deja vu experience. Again and again, there is a recurrent uh, situation where a colleague stands up, makes a presentation, which seems to me like a farce, like a three-act farce. The first act, the colleague shows us some data about the environmental calamity that we are in, in terms of some indicators, be that energy use increase, global temperature increase, the concentration of greenhouse gas uh, increase, and, and all of that, we know that. So that basically catches our attention. The second act, then they talk about the role of buildings. Again, data supports the supposition that the buildings are responsible for a major fraction of energy use and environmental emissions in the EU countries, roughly 40%. But after the second act, something very strange happens. Then suddenly they show you some instance of a so-called green building or uh, buildings with sustainable features uh, green facade, green roofs, all of that. And the problem is, explicitly, most often implicitly, they suggest this is a solution to the aforementioned problems of the planetary crisis. And that is something that I have a bit of a problem with. Sometimes I feel myself like the, uh, the famous boy in the uh, story of the emperor with new clothes. You hear all these buzzwords, they're important. I work in these areas, net zero energy buildings, energy efficient buildings, green buildings, uh, PV integrated in buildings, and all of that. But the question is, to which extent are they the answer or the solution to these problems that we have talked about? Many years ago, I had this discussion with a colleague in a Viennese coffee house, and we did a back of the envelope calculation and suggested, imagine a city like Vienna, two million people almost, and imagine the energy use of every person per day, and then you would say, what would happen if you get rid of all the buildings, existing buildings, and instead we would have in their place buildings that would be most efficient in terms of the applicable standards, low energy buildings. And then you would get data such as this. You can compare this daily energy consumption of a typical Viennese in terms of existing buildings, in terms of transportation, if they drive 25 kilometers per day with their cars, if they do one transatlantic flight every year for the gadgets and other things. 
And now if you imagine that you would replace all of these buildings in this two million city with these energy efficient buildings, you would get roughly 7% reduction of per capita energy use. Nothing to scoff at is important, but is that the solution we are talking about and we are expecting or we are claiming that we have? And the problem doesn't stop there. The problem is that this is, of course, a vastly amazing scenario, get rid of the buildings and get new buildings. But even if you look at the new buildings and we see that, okay, maybe we can get individual buildings more and more efficient, but with what if the demand of the society for size and volume and so on increases all the time? The data from US, for example, within a century, the average size of homes doubled. It reminds me a little bit of something that you probably have observed. If you think about the course 50 years ago with Cinquecento or something like that, and today's course, all surrounded in our cities. Of course, we can make the energies more efficient, we have been able to do that. The technology is allowed to do that. But part of that gains is offset by the fact that we want even bigger, bigger cars, fast cars, and uh, so on and so forth. So it seems to me that this notion of, okay, we can take care of everything by having just new buildings that are more sustainable isn't really working. Many colleagues, many people suggest, okay, maybe we should look at the existing building stock. At least in countries such as Europe, that's the dominant energy sink, the buildings that are already there. What if we focus on those and go, for example, to retrofit, thermal retrofit, make the building better insulated and so on and so forth, better windows and uh, all of the good things. A couple of years ago, a PhD student of mine looked at a bunch of buildings in Austria that went through this process of thermal retrofit. So from the existing standard, conventional standards, these buildings were retrofitted to the level of so-called passive house as a very efficient standard. And here you see for a sample of these buildings, the energy performance as expected by the architects when they were planning for this retrofit. These are very small, relatively speaking, small heating energy demand predicted. Then we went, after the retrofit was executed, we went back to these buildings and looked at their actual performance. And that's how it looks. Order of magnitudes higher. It has to make us a bit cautious. Why? Well, there are various theories for that. And one common theory is uh, the so-called rebound effect. Whenever you have a technical artifact, and you make it more efficient so that you can get more out of it with the same amount of energy, there is a tendency to ask more. So people in homes, for example, say, great, now we have more energy efficient buildings, let's have higher temperatures inside. In the middle of winter, let's open the windows, have fresh air, everybody loves fresh air. So this rebound effect is responsible for the fact that in many instances, and not just here, you can have reports from many countries that the level of improvement that you expect when you go through this retrofit process is usually optimistic. The actual uh, improvement that you get is much more modest, uh, comparatively speaking. And that's not the only problem. Uh, the problem is also the rate of retrofit. We have this building stock uh, in European countries. The rate of retrofit, that means the fraction of buildings that will go through a retrofit every year is less than 2% of the existing building stock every year. Which means you would have theoretically wait half a century to go through this process of having all of these buildings not brought to this standard. And remind you that we're just talking about retrofit in general, even not all of that is thermal retrofit uh, per se. Some of it is just maintenance and maybe cosmetic things. But anyhow, you see that with this type of rate of retrofit and the problems that I mentioned, uh, it's just uh, very limited, relatively speaking, the scope of what we could expect. So sometimes people ask, oh, okay, so what really works? And I've looked at a bunch of studies where they try to compare different measures in terms of, for example, the scope of reducing the global emission of uh, CO2 equivalent greenhouse gases. 
And some of them results are surprising. The Drawdown Project, for example, suggests that the best, most effective strategy is to educate and empower girls and women. It's on top. Another study recently suggested, again, compared uh, a lot of measures and so on and so forth, and said, actually, you know, the most effective measure is to think about it is to have one child less. Uh, strange, right? And people get a little bit defensive and emotional about that, and we can also start talking about the numbers and studies, but you can understand very quickly the relationship is a very logical consequences of a consequence of population growth if you have more people that they will have create more anthropogene environmental impact that's just the, the logic of it and this is even not considering that their demand on resources may increase the population increase is a reality uh, you can imagine a stadium with capacity of 16,000 people in the course of a one football match that stadium would be filled with the net amount of people added to the planet. 16,000 people in a period of time less than two hours. This happens all the time. It has implications. It has implications for industry, for agriculture, for traffic, and of course for buildings. In my country, we seal more than 10 hectares of natural ground every day and replace that with asphalt and concrete. Some of that irreversibly. Again, to go back to football, it is more than 10 football fields of asphalt and concrete and built space every day. It's a small country. Austria is less than 1% of US, United States of America in terms of size. So extrapolate that and see what we are doing. Some people say that's maybe a pessimistic view. In fact, if you look at uh, many countries, the rate of population growth has decreased significantly, specifically if the countries go through a process of industrialization and if the uh, living standards go higher and so on and so forth, you see drop of fertility rates, number of kids, number of babies per, per woman. There are some four countries, just an example. You see within a period of 50, 60 years, a major drop in fertility rates. So should be, why should be worried? Well, as I just said, this country go through an industrialization or, or an increase in living standard process and that is interesting because there is a relationship between that uh, standard of living typically expressed in terms of GDP and the, and the ecological footprint of people in these countries. Having higher living standards means more demand on resources. It is just a consequence of that process. So you, you might have lesser people, but over this period of time, the ecological footprint increases in sight. Just for those four countries, just to give you a feeling, ask yourself how many times the footprint of the babies in these countries increased over these last 50, 60 years. And for these uh, four countries, these are the numbers, just estimated. So the argument by saying that we selectively have certain uh, improvements or changes in terms of, of, of these large fertility rates just doesn't cut and uh, is really not quite convincing. So we can look at the data that you all know and ask ourselves, okay, how many planets would, would we need if everybody would live like an American or like an Australian or European or like an Indian? And here we very clearly see the effect of these living standards and industrialization and so on and so forth, this demand. But we can also look at the data in a different way and ask ourselves, for the citizens of a country, how many of their own country would they need in order to maintain their uh, living standards? And then suddenly you see that, for example, there's not much difference between uh, US and India. In one case, it is this high demand of resources. In the other case, it's the large numbers. And we want that people come out of poverty. We don't want to have the ecological footprint small because people are poor. We want it because our system is more efficient. 
So, as engineers, we look, we like to think about engines, right? Uh, play around with engines. We like to make engines more efficient, right? Faster. But there is a problem here, which is not a technological problem. This is not an engineering problem. You can make the engine of this vessel as efficient as you want. The problem is the direction. As it is famously said, if you go in the direction that you're heading, you end up where you're heading. And that is not a problem that can be solved by technology. That is a problem that needs to consider the social factors, the policy, the politics, the economy, the human psychology. There are no simple engineering solutions for that. So, come back to my initial question. I think you know the answer. The one through sustainable building is the one that you don't build. 